Galicia in northwestern Spain. In certain strategic spots, we see walled areas with strange circular structures made of stone. Who did these hill forts belong to? Who were they defending themselves from? How did they live? These are the archaeological remains of the Castro culture. This is the Castro de Baroña in Porto do Son, on the mouth of the Noya River. It once looked like this. But before exploring life in a Castro, let's take a trip back in time. In this land of rugged coastlines and towering cliffs, the sea has always kept the inhabitants of villages along the Atlantic coast from being cut off from each other. Paleolithic man sought shelter in natural caves and caverns, his itinerant life of hunter-gatherer made it possible for him to survive in an environment that was fertile but extremely dangerous. His way of life changed drastically with the arrival of the agricultural age. It was then that he began to leave his mark on the landscape. In the megalithic era, the sea became a source of contacts. Before the Metal Ages, the people of Atlantic Europe were the first to build great monuments that were destined to stand the test of time. What is the meaning of the alignments of more than 3,000 vertical stones in Karnak, in French Brittany? It took them several centuries to erect them in about 3,300 BC. Why did they do it? In Ireland, the funerary mound in Newgrange is one of the most important megalithic monuments in all of Europe. It was built hundreds of years before the pyramids in Egypt. Its external walls are made of quartzite. The pantheon and surrounding vertical stones are decorated with spirals, circles, and mysterious zigzag lines. Was this merely a tomb? Some experts describe it as a vast astronomical observatory, like the Shrine of Stonehenge. Its construction involved the removal, cutting, and transport of huge blocks of stone, some weighing as much as 30 tons each, from as far away as 70 kilometers. We continue to wonder why these titanic projects were undertaken, in which vast human and economic resources were mobilized as well as requiring a capacity for planning and organization. In Galicia, the first megalithic tombs appeared in about 4,500 BC. They consisted of funeral chambers built with enormous stones. These were known as dolmens. Raised to a vertical position, the gigantic stones formed a funeral chamber with a small entryway. The dolmen was buried, creating a tomb made of earth and stone. The largest stone blocks were cut to measure, sealing off the burial chamber.
The body of the deceased was interred inside the dolmen. The prestigious objects buried with him speak to the existence of social hierarchies. Those dolmens, or mamoas as they're known in Galicia, where notable members of the community were buried, functioned as veritable mausoleums. They were at once tombs and sanctuaries where ceremonies were held to make offerings to ancestors and to the cult of the dead. The disintegration of organic remains due to the passage of time and the soil's acidity make it difficult to study these megalithic burial sites. The numerous ceramic fragments found in the tombs, many of which once formed bell-shaped containers, point to the existence of libations in the ceremonies that were held, and to the introduction of funerary rites from other areas. The colossal effort made by late Neolithic societies in the construction of these monuments, as well as their presence in many parts of the countryside, show the important role played by ancestors and a profound belief in the great beyond, in life after death. Our journey along the prehistoric Atlantic coast brings us to one of the most unique artistic manifestations from this period, petroglyphs. Man felt the need to capture in stone certain aspects of his life and his beliefs. The carvings were made by chiseling with pointed pieces of quartz or flint. Grooves were then widened using abrasion. Religious symbols appear alongside scenes from daily life. Galicia's Rías Bajas region is the principal site of Atlantic cave paintings, which can also be found on the British Isles and in French Brittany. In the Bronze Age, populations grew and settlements became more stable. Locals practiced simple agricultural methods. Environmental pressures became more marked. Forests were cut down and vegetation burned in order to create small fields. This is still the case today in less developed areas of the world. During controlled burns, they hunted small animals fleeing from the fire. They worked the land with spades made of stone and sticks to cultivate legumes and primitive varieties of wheat and other grains. Every few years, they changed location. Livestock animals were more important, economically speaking. A budding industry in meat, milk products, hides and wool was just beginning. Settlements were no longer made up only of nuclear families, but were stable hamlets and towns. Later, they would become castros, like this one in Castromao, one of the oldest in Galicia. Along the coast, strategic points like peninsulas and outcrops were established. These offered naturally favorable defensive conditions and were reinforced using terracing and fences. These small outposts are inhabited by just a few families. Their location makes it possible to directly access a great variety of resources from the sea. They make their living mainly by fishing, trapping shellfish, and raising gardens. These resources are complemented by raising livestock and gathering wild fruits. The sea becomes an open door for cultural and commercial exchange and contacts with other populations.
metallurgy, or metalworking, was the greatest technological innovation in the history of humanity. It brought about a real revolution, a global change. Polished stone tools provided a model for new tools made of bronze. From the time metalworking first began to be practiced in about 2500 BC, products made of metal were actively exchanged all along the Atlantic coast and beyond. Intense sea traffic connected the Iberian Peninsula, the British Isles, and the area around the English Channel. They used boats made of wicker and covered in hide. These were waterproofed using tallow. Galicia's terrain is quite uneven. There are numerous low mountain ranges, plateaus, valleys, and mountains that measure more than 2,000 meters above sea level. Their slopes are covered by abundant deciduous species including beech, oak, and alder trees. In the central and eastern ranges, various rivers have their source and grow to carve out various geographic features. Rivers descend from their mountaintop springs and push forward, sculpting the landscape. On their bracken-covered banks, an age-old forest grows, remaining in constant shade. Here, the landscape becomes mysterious and secretive. Societies in the Bronze Age consecrated nature with divinities that were associated with the mountains, rivers, springs, lakes, and forests. The shaman and medicine man drew their inspiration from the heart of these forests, which even today are the object of dark tales of witches and magic spells. Many features of religious practices from the Bronze Age have survived the passage of time fossilized in European folklore. Nymphs, goblins, gnomes, and other spirits are mythical entities that have their roots in that remote era. It's possible that fishermen and hunters explored these hidden areas and were subjected to some sort of initiation ceremony, similar to those that are still common in some animistic communities in Africa and the Americas. Protection was provided from the fearsome supernatural forces that existed in these spots. Gathering shellfish on Galicia's coasts and in the mouths of its rivers is an activity that goes back as far as the mists of time. The phenomenon known as upwelling results in an extraordinary rise in the number of phytoplankton in the water, making these coasts a fishing ground whose biodiversity is unique in all the world. Settlers in the late Bronze Age, at the dawn of the Castro cultures, captured crustaceans among the rocks on the tidal flats. They also consumed goose barnacles, mussels, limpets, and sea snails. Evidence of fishing has been discovered in the many remains of fish that have been found, including hake, mackerel, scad, sea bream, conger eel, and a full complement of other species. In order to make their catch, they used nets and hooks made of copper, bronze, and iron. Octopus meat was dried, while bluefish were smoked and then dry cured. Most Castro communities were self-sufficient, able to cover their own basic needs, and were even capable of producing surplus goods. In their stables, they raised domestic animals like rabbits, pigs, and certain birds. Goods they were unable to produce, like salt and minerals needed for metalworking, made it necessary to barter year-round with neighboring settlements.
Curing hides was the basis for the leather industry. All sorts of clothing, harnesses, and shoes could be made using this material. Grain was processed in boat-shaped mills, which required considerable effort. Settlements were groups of families that shared most of their resources. Many sustenance-related jobs were carried out by the entire community. Our travels now take us to La Lanzada in the Rias Bajas region. The shrine and the remains of an ancient castle are witness to the significant role this enclave played in Galician history. Settled in the 7th century BC, it is a rich archaeological site that has provided valuable data on the Castro cultures. From the beginning, this was an enclave that was dedicated to maritime trade. Here, boats arrived from the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula, loaded with a wide variety of goods. Near this settlement, there were seams of tin, the metal that traders received as payment in their commercial transactions. In our archaeological excavations in La Lanzada, we have found evidence of material exchanges between Phoenicians, Cartagines and Castreños. For example, here we have remains of amphora. The amphora were brought by the Phoenicians and the Cartagines in boats that were placed here in the Ensenada of La Lanzada. Y acompañando estos objetos aparecían también perfumarios, eh, eh, joyas, etc. ¿no? En este sentido, la lanzada fue un enclave comercial importantísimo en las relaciones entre el norte y el sur, entre el Atlántico y el Mediterráneo, ¿no? gracias a esta navegación fenicia que llegaba aquí a, a la lanzada. ¿no? At the end of the Bronze Age, the Phoenicians founded trade routes all over the Mediterranean. They traveled to the ends of the known world, attracted by the wealth of the mythical Cassiterides. These islands of tin were said in ancient myths to be located in the darkest part of the ocean, beyond the Pillars of Hercules. For locals, the Cassiterides were a sort of El Dorado, a spot on their mythical map that represented the proverbial abundance of metals on Atlantic lands. They traded with Atlantic settlements for centuries until the fall of Carthage in the second century BC. They brought crockery, jewelry, textiles, preserves, salt, and metals. At the beginning of the first millennium BC, the Phoenicians had already introduced iron and glass to the southern areas of the Atlantic trade routes. Innovations like revolving mills and pottery wheels were quickly adopted, together with other new tools. They also assimilated trends in the consumption of food, clothing, and personal accessories. Atlantic settlements exported tin beginning in ancient times. They produced standardized weights, which they used to pay for imports. They also offered silver, gold, and animal hides in trade. At the beginning of the Iron Age in Europe's highest altitude settlements, defensive elements and walls were built. The fall of Mediterranean civilizations like the Mycenaean and Hittite cultures resulted in a collapse in trade. Metal became scarce and its value rose. Settlements had to fortify themselves in order to defend their reserves and their metallurgic production from attacks by pillaging bands. All of Europe began to experience a higher level of warring activity. New iron tools allow inhabitants of the Castros to perfect their stone hewing, woodworking, and building techniques.
As settlements were surrounded by walls, converting them into little fortresses, homes made of earth were transformed into houses made of stone. Significant population growth saw the multiplication of castros in the area. Agricultural technologies exploited valley floors more effectively, allowing for higher productivity. New settlements were located at lower elevations. Economic and cultural exchange became more fluid, especially with the British Isles. Let's go there now and see how ancient settlers once lived. On the edge of a 100-meter cliff, we find Dun Angasa, the largest prehistoric fortified settlement on the Aran Islands in Ireland. Its defensive system of concentric walls and stone spikes is quite similar to the Castros of Galicia. The reconstruction of the Castelhenge settlement in Wales shows the similar uses and customs found among settlers in Atlantic territories. The houses are circular in shape, with walls of stone and a conical roof of plant fiber, practically identical to those found in the Castros. Whitewashed walls feature circular and cruciform drawings, symbolizing the sun. At the mouth of the Minho River, Santa Tecla Mountain is home to one of the most celebrated Castros in northwest Spain. It was built around the first century BC. The archaeological site affords views of one of the most beautiful landscapes in Galicia. Houses, staircases, homes, paved roads and waterways speak of a society that reached a considerable level of technical development for its time. Stone cutters worked in a variety of ways to adapt each building to the terrain. The large stables found in some sites indicate the importance of cattle, which provided pulling power, food, hides, and fertilizer. In Galicia, nature reveals herself in a powerful way. Great tides build up sandbanks, estuaries, and beaches, which favor the development of various marine bivalves, including clams, cockles, oysters, limpets, razor clams, and scallops. Where coastal waters are calmer, with a sandy bottom, women gathered all sorts of bivalves, which were a complementary source of food. The size of species that have been documented by archaeologists is quite a bit larger than today's commercial sizes. Resources in those days were not being overexploited. We are familiar with the dietary habits in coastal castros thanks to their waste sites. Scientists refer to these areas as concheiros, a name which speaks to the abundance of mollusks found there. Women were in charge of all activity related to textiles. The remains of loom weights and spindles found in various dig sites tell us that weaving and spinning were of great importance to these communities. Linen and wool made up the base of the textile industry, which also made use of Mediterranean innovations. Compound looms, as well as plates, distaffs, and winders, allowed them to perfect their spinning and weaving techniques. New influences in dress and personal accessories arrived from the outside world. It became fashionable to shave. In order to protect grain from humidity, they made wicker containers, which were the precursors of the traditional Galician orio.
Although the potter's wheel was already in use, hand-molded ceramics continued to be common. Rolls of clay were crafted, which were then arranged in a spiral, creating the shape of the pot's base. Afterward, the clay strips were molded together, the surface was smoothed over, and the final shape was obtained. Later, the pot was left to dry completely before being fired. More delicate pieces were fired using special pottery kilns, but generally, primitive bonfire ovens continued to be used to prepare small pieces for domestic use. These ovens consisted of a pit dug in the ground with a cross strip in the direction of dominant winds. Later, the pyre was partially buried, increasing the temperature. For many communities in the Northwest, warring activity played an important role. From the time they were young, inhabitants were trained for war. The Castros perfected their defensive systems with a series of moats and parapets that followed the line of the fortified walls. They also reinforced their gates by flanking them with walls and huge towers. These were built for seeing and being seen. In later settlements, like this one in Villadonga, in Lugo province, the walls were purposefully built to be monumental, which lent an air of prestige to the setting. Blacksmiths played a very important role. War and the defense of common goods against pillaging gave them special status. Locals depended on them for the production and improvement of weapons. They also played a key role in the expansion of agriculture, thanks to the production of farming tools. Galician warriors fastened a dagger to their belts and carried a round shield called a caeta. They could carry a sword or several spears. They protected themselves with helmets, cuirasses, and greaves, and adorned themselves with neck rings, armbands, and diadems. Los hombres, las mujeres y los niños que vivían en los castros formaban parte de una sociedad guerrera y campesina. La guerra era muy importante en estas comunidades y eso se refleja en el hecho de que sus poblados, eh, sus asentamientos, los castros, están fortificados con fosos, con parapetos, con empalizadas, como vemos en este, en este poblado. ¿no? Eh, era una guerra importante, había pues, una guerra para buscar botín entre distintas aldeas, había captura de ganado, de mujeres, y eso aparece muy bien reflejado en lo que son las referencias de los geógrafos latinos y griegos cuando nos hablaban de las comunidades castreñas. In the mountains of Galicia, horses graze freely. These local breeds, with their archaic features, are the descendants of those that lived here more than 2,000 years ago. Horses were a symbol of power and wealth. Their meat was never consumed, but rather they were used in times of war and in sacrificial rites. Classical author Diodorus Siculus writes about pillaging bands. When their youth reached the fullness of their physical strength, those among them who had few material riches met up in areas of the mountains which were difficult to reach and formed bands of a considerable size, and then went down to Iberia to gather riches by pillaging. Because of their importance, horses were magnificent loot. The brave youth in these bands captured horses by knocking them to the ground. 
It's possible that this manner of trapping them has survived the years in the popular annual festival of the Rapadas Bestas, in which horses are brought down from the mountains, caught, and then held while their manes are caught. Whoa! Greco-Latin historian Strabo, to whom we owe the best available descriptions of this time period, describes young inhabitants of the Castros in this way. They are skillful in matters of ambush and exploration. They are light on their feet and able to escape danger. As it seems, they had a great knowledge of military techniques, to which they added their own rules. These highlighted personal bravery, intimidation, manliness, and ferociousness. we can assume that initiation ceremonies were held. To be accepted as warriors, young men had to pass a test. They had to either hunt a wild animal, like a bear, a wolf, or a wild boar, or they had to kill one of their enemies. It seems like a page out of a storybook. On this small peninsula, at the mouth of the Muros and Noya Inlet, battered by the sea and furious winds, we find the solitary citadel of Baronia, one of Galicia's most spectacular and most frequently visited prehistoric sites. This is an enigmatic spot. Visitors feel a magnetism that can be compared to that which is felt at the famous Cromlech of Stonehenge. The monumentality of its structures and its geographical location make this an exceptional archaeological site among the more than 3,000 in Galicia, about half of all European sites on the Atlantic coast. Its fortified wall, which features various circuits on different levels, has an intentional scenographic feel. This daring public work reflects a decisive will to command a level of prestige over neighboring communities. At the Castro of Borneido, in La Coruña, as in most archaeological sites, we can observe how the arrangement of structures in the interior of each area was determined by the line of the wall, the uneven terrain, and the curved layout of the dwellings. Each house was independent and shared no walls with any other, leaving dead space between each structure. In later settlements, straight lines begin to appear, along with square and rectangular structures, which make better use of the space by stringing the buildings together. The dwellings had doors that were protected by buttresses and pitched roofs. Urbanism in the Castros became highly developed in southern areas, from the Rias Bajas to the Duero River in modern-day Portugal. Here, large settlements called Citanias emerged, like Briteiros and San Fins. These were proto-cities, which had large populations and played a central role in territorial organization. Around the same time, the so-called monuments with ovens were built, also known as Castro Saunas. This example is from Punta dos Prados in Ortigueira, in the province of La Coruña. One of the best conserved examples is from the Castro of Briteiros. Strabo writes about how the Galicians took steam baths, following them up with cold water baths. They were built with large slabs of stone and were closed off from the exterior. The steam chamber was sealed with Pedra Formosa, which was decorated with rosettes, cords, swastikas, net-like forms, and interlocking elements. Pentagonal in shape, its base had a small semicircular hole through which bathers entered the space by crawling. In this way, the steam could be largely contained. Castro saunas were built with a rectangular layout and were partially underground. They had pitched roofs and were divided into three rooms and one atrium. 
Water was channeled toward the interior, where it was heated by incandescent stones in the oven chamber. Another magnificent example of a sauna can be found in San Fins, also in Portugal. According to some writers, the castro... Hidden in the heart of the forests, experts have discovered Castro sanctuaries dedicated to the god Lugus, the most important of the Celtic deities. In certain areas along the rivers, which were symbolic gateways to the other world, ritual weapon offerings were made to the goddess Nabia. Protector of community, she was also linked to the idea of reincarnation. Warriors gave up their weapons in the presence of holy men who were consecrated to this deity. They believed in creator gods from this world, in divinities related to war, to physical vigor and strength, and in deities associated with production and abundance. A specialized class of priests existed, which was highly influential in the community. Druids, holy men, and soothsayers were consulted and revered as mortals in possession of mysterious knowledge who were able to see far beyond the world of the living. Their predictions and counsel were followed by nobility and warriors alike. Ancient societies were always religious in some way, and as is still the case in Africa, almost all aspects of life had a dimension that was religious or magical. This explains the ongoing offerings and ritual sacrifices of marked Celtic character. From its beginnings in the Northern Alps, the Celtic language spread throughout the West and into the Iberian Peninsula, where several archaic variants of this language came to be spoken. In many spots where crosses can be seen today, there were once stones dedicated to each path, called Lares Vialis. These were replaced by the church in the sixth century. The stones represented domestic deities related to ancestral spirits, which were believed to roam the trails. Strabo writes that the sick were left at crossroads to be cured by spirits that had suffered from similar illnesses. Many of the sanctuaries dedicated to these gods were Christianized through the many cruceiros, which can still be seen throughout Galicia. The funeral horn sounds from the highest cliffs. A powerful warrior has fallen and will soon be cremated. Along with many islands, these protruding rocks in the sea were once considered border territories between the earthly world and the supernatural one, located in a far-off spot in the middle of the ocean. Castro funeral rites continue to be a mystery as scarcely any archaeological trace has been left. But recently, an important discovery was made in Bialba, in the province of Lugo, a necropolis consisting of small holes with pots holding ashes. The tradition of Celtic cremation seems to have been revealed. The deceased was stripped of all personal adornments, including bracelets, neck rings, and antenna-hilted daggers. The officiant handed his weapons and possessions to the dead man's nephew. In these northwestern lands, daughters traditionally inherited their mother's possessions, while males had a special bond with their maternal uncles. Once the pyre was lit, 
The congregants began to make a low guttural sound, recalling the sound of a bumblebee in flight. Until just a few decades ago, the sound could still be heard at the occasional Galician wake. They blew the horn strongly to summon the ancestral spirits so that they might accompany the deceased soul beyond the sea horizon at twilight where the Celtic paradise was located. Recent discoveries made in Galician castros show that the ashes of the deceased were buried in a cyst or casket in the floor of the family home. This funerary cart from the Martin Sarmiento Museum in Guimarães shows how metal was worked beginning in the third millennium BC. In the Castro age, exquisitely refined techniques were developed. Bracelets, earrings, armbands, and neck rings of gold brought together European tastes with Mediterranean influences. The treasure of Caldas, part of which is located in the Museum of Pontevedra, dates to the late Bronze Age, Made of ring-shaped ingots, armbands, diadems, ceremonial bowls, and gold combs, it weighed a total of 37 kilos. All of the pieces fit the system of weights using Phoenician coins, indicating that gold and silver work was already being exported at this time. The Castro San Cibrao de Las, in Orense, is one of the largest and most well-preserved. we can see groups of dwellings and storehouses whose doors open onto a central flagstone courtyard. The social and spatial independence of these homes denote the market economic autonomy of each family. The walls are monumental. There are cobblestone streets, cisterns, and waterways. In this late Castro period, it is believed that these settlements were moving toward the formation of city-states. We refer to the Celts, but did a Celtic nation ever really exist? Nowadays, the prevailing theory is that the Celts were not a race or even a people. Rather, theirs was a linguistic and cultural flow which began in the Northern Alps. There were communities that spoke languages from the Celtic group and which shared Indo-European pantheons and ideologies. What is certain is that many people from ancient Galicia called themselves Celts, spoke Celtic dialects, worshipped divinities with Celtic origins, and were identified by classical scholars as Celts. Banquets have always encouraged brotherhood at the table. In this era, according to the writer Strabo, on special occasions, Castro leaders from different clans held banquets that took on a ritual character. The Greco-Latin writer tells of how they were seated on benches that ran around the walls, according to age and rank. The food was passed around the circle while they drank the little wine they had. In their recipes, they used butter instead of oil. He also describes how at the end of the meal, they danced in a circle to the sounds of a flute, jumping and falling to their knees. The soothing stillness of nature is altered by a far-off sound. Under the bowery of trees, the echo of a strange visitor can be heard. Peace is threatened by the arrival of the Roman legions. 
The Romans were not unknown to residents of the Castros. Many Galician mercenaries had joined Hannibal on his march over the Alps against Rome. On their relentless advance, they found vestiges of ancient cultures. In the Elbierzo region, which borders modern-day Galicia, the ghostly landscapes of Las Medulas is startling in its scale. Its vertical walls are the result of the intentional demolition of the mountain that stood here before the arrival of the Romans. It was the largest gold mine in the Western Roman Empire, and the techniques used here to extract the metal continued to be employed up until the Industrial Revolution. In order to reach the deepest reserves of gold, Roman miners destroyed huge swaths of land using a system known as Ruina Montium. They created a network of wells and dead-end galleries. Then, enormous amounts of water that had been held in great marshes at a higher altitude were suddenly released. The resulting air compression in the tunnels acted as an explosive. The mined area broke off from the mountain and crumbled away. Galician gold stimulated the empire's drive to conquer. It has been calculated that in the northwestern mines, the Romans extracted about 200,000 kilos of gold. residents have captured a Roman magistrate and plan to sacrifice him so that they can use his body in a divination rite. <coughs> Strabo speaks about these divination practices. They examine entrails without removing them, and they examine the veins located on the torso and make predictions as they touch them, and they consult the entrails of their prisoners of war. They cover them with a sagum, then the Haruspex beats them in the area of the entrails. They make their first prediction based on how the body falls. They cut the right hand of each prisoner to consecrate them to the god Ares. Occupation of the northwestern part of the peninsula was slow and costly. The conquest took place in three phases. In the year 136 BC, Brutus Gallicus annexed the area between the Duero and Minho rivers. In 61 BC, Julius Caesar reached the port of Arthabros on a maritime expedition and was not met with resistance. The Emperor Augustus personally directed the campaigns in the Cantabrian Wars, which ended in 19 BC. Diodorus relates that the residents of the north sang victory hymns when they were crucified. Prisoners committed suicide, Mothers killed their own children rather than falling into slavery. They preferred death to defeat. The arrival of the Romans was the beginning of the end for the Galicians. Imperial powers used existing structures to integrate the population. In the late first century AD, the Castro culture had come to an end.